Welcome to Campaigns and Coffee. Grab your mug and let's dive into tales of adventure and the answers to your quirkiest of questions. Uh, today we're talking about hunting a fallen angel in Ken's Elemental Apocalypse D and D campaign. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you while you were sipping your coffee and rolling your <laughs> dice. I should always let a man complete sipping his coffee and rolling his dice before I start talking. <laughs> I should have uh, should have rolled the dice before I introduced the topic. So, Ken, what what is this uh, fallen angel in your Elemental Apocalypse campaign? Yeah, so it's actually a, a literal angel who fell from the heavens rather than a fallen angel like, say, you know, the devil. But uh, the setup for the campaign right now is uh, the Temple of Elemental Evil rose, Orith, World of Greyhawk <clears throat> fell... Um, there's all kinds of elemental factions running around and a handful of angels showed up on the prime material plane because they wanted to take the fight to the demons and other ele like elemental forces that are uh, basically laying waste to the plane, right? Or mm -hmm. to reality as our characters understand it. And so there was this epic fight between these angels and um, the, the demons who had been pursuing them. Uh, and they saw, like, this was happening up in the sky, and then the, the angels came crashing down to Aura, slammed into a mountain range, um, triggered a couple of volcanic eruptions, struggled back to their feet, leapt back into the air, additional fights continued with air elementals and other sorts of things, and then one of the angels, again, comes crashing to the ground, um, but isn't able to get back up again. And so for the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been building towards this. Uh, the characters found a sun sword that belongs to this angel, and now they are seeking him out so that they might reunite the blade with the angel. And if, uh, if you're looking for my inspiration for this, it is very much the original Red Dawn and mm. the uh, F-15 pilot, the Eagle Driver, who comes oh, okay. crashing okay. down, right? And, like, the, the kids in, in Red Dawn find him, and he becomes, like, the grizzled old advisor for them as they're waging this guerrilla warfare against the Soviet invaders, right? Um, and so that's definitely the mental image I have. And... This part of the campaign's been sort of growing in my head as, like, we don't quite get to where they're going to get to with the angel. And so I add a little bit more, and then I add a little bit more. And so where I'm at <clears> now is creating basically sort of um, a connected overland adventure to get them to where they need to be. And because I want it to be, I want the, the elemental apocalypse wasteland. Like, one, one of the things I've been trying to do is, is introduce ideas of, like, how this is different from regular or a regular Greyhawk where we've been adventuring for you know, 25 years. And so this sure. is an opportunity to show how the whole wastes, H-O-L-L, -L, um, used to be the whole swamp. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> anyway, or, how this yeah. uh, region has been devastated by the flooding of the Azure Sea and the swamp has turned into this briny wasteland sort of thing, right? So... As I'm doing this, I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, so how do I present it to my characters? Because I don't want it to just be, um, I want to, it's not quite theater of the mind, but I also want to um, have a visual to help them understand exactly where things are happening. Uh, and so I've been working on an overland map in Incarnate. It's the first time I've done an overland map. Let's see. I, ah, here we go. Still, still getting used to Incarnate. So I'm sharing my screen out for the folks who are listening at home. Um, yep. And so the idea is in the northern, north, western portion of the map, up near the top, there's these mountains that are coming down. They're called the Tours. Um, the players got their got into a really bad fight in the last adventure, and then they retreated back up into the mountains mm. or into the hills to lick their wounds. And so what I'm trying to do, what I'm thinking about doing for the Overland map, although I appreciate your insights, is kind of doing a sustained skill challenge, right? So taking that from 4th edition and Star Wars Saga edition, or call it a extended skill check, you know, where mm -hmm. the players make a series of checks. And if they fail the, the demon storm, which is the people, the, uh, elemental slash demon demonic faction that is also hunting the angel, um, gets one step closer. Right. And so they get three failures. Every step, the demon storm gets closer to finding their prey. When the players get a success, they um, they find something interesting. So maybe they find a demon storm camp and they could do something about it. They encounter a demon storm patrol and they could do something about it. Uh, they find evidence of the angels so that they can continue to move along um, okay. on their trek to actually find him. And so I think that's how I want to do it, rather than being like a straight up hex crawl. Like so, this map that you can see in front of you, it's gonna. Right. I think I'm gonna like have this blocked out 
And then as they move in, I'll reveal different sections of it over time. And so they don't necessarily see the whole thing at once. Or maybe, I don't know, I have these little symbols on it to indicate uh, like the campfires or where the demon storm are going to be and the little stylized suns or where the angel is going to be. <clears throat> um, maybe I just stick that into a, la a DM only layer, lay down this map so they can see like holistically what it looks like. But then I reveal the individual things in roll 20 as we go along. So I like that that last part because if they're up on the mountains they should be able to see this big plane but they wouldn't be able to see like any details and the campfire may or may not be there when they look that sort of thing um yeah i think, I think you know cool. i mean yeah having and I, I can have incarnate has this this cool um cloud effects and so they are overlooking this kind of desolate swamp and so having the whole map revealed and actually calling out where those campfires are could be interesting right because they know maybe where to avoid or where to go to mm -hmm. um over i can't actually ping but you can see my mouse this area over here is going to yeah. be some ruins so they could actually see the ruins from on high so it could still be like maybe the skill challenge pieces a little I think the skill challenge piece for me could be basically instead of just having random encounters, like if their characters do well or not indicates whether or not they're going to get into trouble. I, I like the idea of the cloud cover. I would like put a couple of points of interest that they could see, but then put a cloud cover layer so that they might be able to only see like a piece of it or not necessarily all of them. And they wouldn't know the exact layout of the terrain. Um, and since they're up on the mountains, um, I, I know from experience being up on a mountain that you can be at or above cloud level, um, on certain days. And so it would just be, it would be really hard to see down into the plains, but it doesn't mean you couldn't see it all. Um, yeah. And this is whole, the all, right. And this is all swampy too, right? So in the early morning, there should be low ground fog kind of yes, covering totally. this particular area anyway, right? Because the, the ground's probably warmer than the surrounding air. So yep. I, I do have on this map this very cloudy area. Um, underneath that is uh, an elemental rift to, uh, I think, the elemental plane of fire. So the um, these rivers or these streams are feeding into it and causing the steam to come up. So Massive I think in this area there would be... Cloud. Yeah. Yeah. In that area. And then like lesser amounts of cloud throughout the rest of the map. Got it. So I think it'll be interesting. Uh, the problem is that <laughs> my concern is I'm coming up with all of these great ideas for individual kind of like set pieces for them to right. have as encounters. And then I have to draw them <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm getting better with incarnate. I can go a lot faster than I was before, but still um, it could be, it could be a lot to try and knock out for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, although, I mean, you don't need to knock everything out for tomorrow. Um, this is true. You, you could, I mean, you could have the, the placeholders there and just say, you see something and then describe like, maybe it's the ruins of a city or something like that over there or, yeah. or a town over there, but you're not sure at this distance and just describe it. Um, as g heading back to your skill challenge though, um, I think that's, I, that's, that's a cool idea. Cause I think if you did it as a, this is a hex crawl, it would feel like, Hey, let's just stumble around until we find something. Right. Um, a right. little bit. And I think it would slow things down more than you would really want to. Um, my first inclination when you were describing the skill challenge is is using like the blades in the dark and having two clocks, one for oh, like, yeah, clocks. the demon yes. forces, one for the players. And then you would have a visual reference to ratchet up the tension of, oh, we made a bunch of failures and they're about to find us or, or something's going to happen. Um, you know, because if you label the clock, they know what that clock's for. Um, if you don't label, label the clock, that also lends a bit of mystery and tension to it as well, because they know it's bad. Um, right, right. But it's a failure clock. <laughs> yeah, but it also what it all what it would also do is let you know how close they are, how close the enemy forces are. If the when when and or if the players succeed, you know kind of like the balance of those successes and failures so that you can tailor the rest of the game beyond that to um, take that into account. Cause it's not just a, 
the players completely succeeded and the demon lord forces are are nowhere to be seen it's they got right on their heels and then you know and then they succeeded okay now what happens after that because now that they've succeeded maybe the demon lord forces are close enough to catch up at that point Yes. Yeah, no, I like that idea. I've, I've forgotten about clocks, and we know how much we love to borrow from other games. So I think having yeah. a visual representation of how they're doing would be cool. The other thing I'm trying to do, so I have my my nice little bullet journal. Probably can't see too well. Again, I'm holding it up to the screen. So uh, I'm going to add that to my list. Um, the other thing I want to do is set up some stuff for the next adventure. So this is a, a big bad swamp corrupted by elemental forces. There is a shadow black dragon out there, which has captured one of the other angels who fell to earth um, and their sun sword. And uh, they're actually okay. going to turn out to be dead um, and currently pickling in the uh, black dragon's lair because that's what black dragons do. And so I want to okay. have some of the taint of the black dragon be something that they come across so that they know, hey, there is dragon sign. There is there's something else out here that we have to worry about, right? So there's right. multiple threats. It's not entirely linear. Like, yes, we have to get the angel back, but maybe we also have to get the hell out of here. Um, and then I think, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping it's going to kind of go, like, they get to the angel and he's just going to be like, I'm glad I have some help now. we got to go get my friend. She's in the clutches of a dragon. <laughs> you know, and then that'll be the cliffhanger. Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. We wanted to run from that thing. <laughs> the... Now, I, I'm familiar with black dragons. What's a shadow black dragon? So in um, shadow dragons are corrupted by the shadow fell in fifth edition. Um, okay. In earlier editions, black uh, shadow dragons were their own kind of dragon. Um, they were basically, uh, I think third edition was the nastiest. I had a really nice shadow dragon that the guys battled with. But they have like a, a negative energy um, breath weapon. They can step into shadows and reemerge from shadows. At least that was the third edition version. I think Ouch. fifth edition shadow dragons are kind of kinder and gentler, and I may have to um, up the up their abilities. I think they, they get like bonuses on their high check. What's the fun in that? <laughs> yeah, but it'll be a spellcaster, so you could probably just cast Shadow Walk or something. But um, you know, I want it to be like an adult dragons or young adult black dragon, so it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Yeah. It, so in this game, um, like we've talked a little bit about it on other shows and things like that. Um, but one of the things I've never really asked is, do you do like the traditional, typical dungeon delving as well in this? Or is it mostly <laughs> overland and and interacting with NPCs and such? So it started, so we're on chapter 11, I think. And so the first couple of chapters were a lot of overland because they were fighting with um, agents of the Burning Keep, which is okay. uh, Kendall, Kendall Keep from the Keep on the Borderlands, was taken okay. over by uh, Blaze, the Burning Eye of Emex, who is like the local warlord. Um, and he had sent out various mercenary factions to find the caves, the caverns of hope, which is where the party is from, which were actually the caves of chaos from the original, um, given the borderlands. And so the party as heroes, were going out to deal with these bands of, uh, evil adventurers basically to prevent them from finding the caves. And so there was a whole lot of overland stuff and there's been some role playing tension and, and that kind of thing as they were hunted and then turned around and became the hunted, um, or became the hunters. Uh, then we had a whole three episode arc where they went into a more traditional dungeon, except it was actually a colossal mimic that they were adventuring around inside of. So mm -hmm. yes, uh, <laughs> there is a traditional dungeon, but uh, it was a giant mimic. But this is also high level, more high level play as well too, right? Sort of. Uh, I think they're sixth level right now, but we gave them an extra oh, wow. feat every three levels. Um, okay. And I'm using a mechanic we call liberation dice which are basically uh, inspiration dice on steroids. You can uh, choose to spend it to reroll a die roll. You can use it, spend it to um, max your damage. I think there's one or two other things we've done with them, kind of like from a story point perspective. Uh, but the whole idea of this campaign is this is the sort of campaign like Underworld or, or um, uh, Resident Evil where the main mm -hmm. characters can do massively stupid, heroic things like throwing themselves off of a cliff and succeed. And so right. the, 
Liberation dice have leaned into that. <laughs> okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, but I think there will be more dungeony stuff when they find when they find the the location of the first fallen angel. There's going to be a small shrine complex. I think they're going to have to deal with some threats in there, and then they'll deal with another sort of underground dungeony thing for the shadow dragon. Gotcha. Um, speaking of dragons, that did remind me we did get a question. Uh, from one of our future overlords in training, uh, which is what are the ethical implications of using mind control spells on dragons to create the ultimate aerial squadron? What I mean, you're going to put this shadow black dragon in there. Um, what 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 would you say if an overlord mind controlled that shadow black dragon to start an aerial squadron? Well, you know. Uh... That's a, that is an excellent question. Um, I mean, the first thing you say as well is it an evil dragon or not? Um, but I don't. Th I, th I think. Uh, I guess from a, from a player perspective, right? Like or a, a PC perspective, if you value free will, then you'd want to. You know, you'd you'd look at this as even being more overlordy than, than normal, right? Because now you have uh, subjugated these creatures to serving you. It's probably even worse if it's like a flight of silver dragons or or gold dragons or whatever, which. Um, maybe ups the the stakes, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, or if you're just like, well, they're mind control. You know, they're they're red dragons. They're going to go rampaging across the countryside anyway. We should go get that helm so we can control them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it depends I, on where your characters come down on free will, right? Yeah, I, I think my take on this is if you're an overlord, um, that kind of implies that you're not a good person. So why are you worrying about ethics? <laughs> so i do I, mean, I do actually have that quandary in this particular campaign it's not a whole squadron <laughs> blaze has not succeeded in, in getting a whole drag a whole squadron but one of the other things i do in this campaign is, is throwbacks to old school D D. and in old school D D, you could go out and subdue a dragon and mm -hmm. then force it once you subdued it which means basically beat it senseless it would serve you right right this was a whole thing in first edition and so I brought that back for this campaign where Blaze and his bands of mercenaries subdued a young adult red dragon and compelled her to be the mount for uh, one of their evil knights. And a couple of adventures ago, the character, the, the evil knight, I think it's like Sir Renford or something like that, showed up to try and recover the sun sword um, that had also fallen to earth. And there was this epic fight going on, the dragon's there, and the dragon let it be known evil red dragon that she was being compelled against her will to serve blaze and that she would she would like to be liberated because uh she is um pregnant with a clutch of eggs and does not want her wormlings to be born into captivity mm. so there's a good one for you <laughs> yeah yeah now as a yeah yeah as a party i could see you know, like as a, a good aligned group of people i could definitely see that being a problem um, but you know, as an overlord, um, yeah, it would, yeah, I would definitely, uh, go after blaze and subdue the red dragon and take it for myself. Um, right. Cause then you can raise a whole flight of, and dragons. then, yeah, you, you, it was just announced <laughs> that there's a whole clutch of red dragon, uh, babies that are, that are coming and you can have, you can just build a squadron, you know, um, yeah. from the ground up. Exactly. So, yeah. Good question. Now, if now if, <laughs> if they had befriended that red dragon after, like, knocking Blaze off or out of the fight and and you know freed it, maybe that red dragon would owe them a favor, the party a favor. In which case, they could use that against the shadow red drag, the shadow uh, black dragon that they're about to fight. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think would be I think that could be. Uh... Yeah, I think, you know, one of the other things I've been trying to do is set up a variety of factions that are not straightforward. Cool. It is Greyhawk. It is about, you know, shades of gray, not absolute good and absolute evil. And so I think entering these sort of moral quandrums where you're like, huh, red dragon, elemental forces are trying to destroy the world. She has to live here, too. Maybe she'll be our friend for a while. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's it for our campaigns and coffee today. Um, so if you, any of you have uh, 
questions um, as you know a minion, a henchman, or a future overlord in training, we would love to hear them. Uh, also, if you have any corrections on how Ken pronounced uh, whole, which is H O L L, um, H O you know, feel free to H what H O O L H O O L. Okay, yeah. So let us know how you pronounce it, um, and uh, yeah, head on over to LayerOfSecrets.com. Uh, we're also Layer of Secrets at, at Dice Camp. Um, you're probably listening to this on the podcast or watching it on YouTube. So uh, like and subscribe if you're over on YouTube or leave us a review somewhere um, like Apple Podcasts would be great. So hopefully your coffee is done now and uh, we'll see you next time. The final sip. <laughs>